as we reflect on this uh, pandemic, today marks a year since we had the first case in South Africa. And so I was asked if I could uh, reflect on what the year has been. As a scientist and as a person who's been trying to understand this virus, who has been trying to uh, ensure that we have the information necessary to guide us in how we deal with this pandemic. And in making these reflections, or in coming up with these <coughs> reflections, I was uh, struck at what a journey it has been. Firstly, it feels like these 12 months was like about 12 years, because so much happens and things move so fast that you don't feel like it's, you know, it's something that's just happened. It feels like it's been a long time. The 5th of March last year feels like, you know, a whole world away. And I don't know if you feel like that, but it certainly feels like that to me. And so as I thought about it and what were the important things that happened, and I will be reflecting really in my world. So I'll be sharing with you things that come from the world of science, comes from the world of trying to understand what this virus is doing and how we can respond. So I'll be sharing that perspective in these reflections. So without further ado, I'm going to proceed with sharing with you COVID-19 in South Africa one year later. What, are, what have I learned? What, what are some of my reflections? So let's start off with uh, the global pandemic. It is quite striking that by the middle of January, we began to see a decline in the global pandemic. And for the five-week period from the 11th of January through to, oops, can you get this fixed, please? It's wrong, wrong slide. You are on the wrong, you know, you are, yeah, okay. Now you're, yeah, correct, thank you. That in the five week period from the 11th of January through to the 18th of February in this year, we saw a 51% decline in the global number of cases. We went from having 738,000 cases down to 361,000 cases. An amazing decline of oh, just over half. And I've been trying to understand this decline. Why is it that for the first time, you think about it, in almost a year, right? the 11th of January was almost a year since we saw the first cases. And it took a whole year before we saw a consistent decline like this over five weeks. And so if you're going to understand this decline, mm -hmm. we needed to understand that the epidemic is really at a global level. It's a mosaic of multiple different epidemics. And in this mosaic of different epidemics, you can see in the different colors in the map on the right-hand side. And what becomes clear is Africa is in the lighter shades. And when you look at North America, South America, and parts of uh, Europe and Russia, you get a sense of the big contributions to the global pandemic. So let's try and understand that decline a little better. Because it's, you know, when you're in, when you're in a situation like we are in South Africa, we sometimes lose sight of the reality that the whole world is dealing with COVID-19. We sort of feel somebody is trying to punish us. But actually, the whole world is dealing with it. And in many settings, the epidemic's much worse than what we have to deal with. So if we look at the global pandemic, what becomes clear 
is that the United States and Europe are the principal drivers of the global trajectory. You can see that in the picture on the left-hand side. Africa, which is on the right-hand side picture, contributes negligibly to the global pandemic. And if you look at the trends in the global pandemic, the drivers of that are not in Asia or in <laughs> Africa. So you're getting a sense of the, the parts of the world that are most heavily afflicted are driving what we see as the global pandemic trajectory. And so this decline is partly due to the declines that we have seen across the US and Europe as the end of the winter second wave. And it just coincides that all these declines occurred at a similar time. And it reflects many things. And I won't go into that in any great detail here. I shared that this morning at the African CDC uh, press conference where I described the four factors that are driving this global decline. Instead, I want to focus here on South Africa. If you look at the South African epidemic, and I'm just going to quickly recount it, many of you are already familiar with it. When we had our first case on the 5th of March, at that initial period, the epidemic in South Africa was growing rapidly. So rapidly that we were doubling every two days. Indeed, at that early stage for the first 20, 21 days of our epidemic, we were competing almost case for case with the UK. We were almost following each other. Our numbers were almost the same as what was being seen in the UK. And the UK population is only slightly bigger than ours. But one of the really critical things that was done was very early on when we just had a few hundred cases, not even a, a single death, we saw very early and decisive action in declaration of the state of disaster. The state of disaster enabled us to control the borders, it enabled us to restrict gatherings, it closed the schools, it provided us with the tools to try and reduce the spread of this virus at that very early stage. For countries that chose not to do that, like the UK, you can see how their trajectory continued. For South Africa, which had the state of disaster and then shortly thereafter the lockdown, we were able to flatten the curve and we slowed viral transmission at a community level at that very early stage. Neil Ferguson, the professor uh, in the UK, who was a member and advisor to the UK government, and his analysis showed that if the UK had instituted their restrictions a week earlier, they would have had only half as many deaths during that month. So it gave you just some idea of how important one week is in this kind of situation, especially when you have an epidemic doubling every day, you can see uh, how, how important it is to act early. And so act early we did. And in that time that we acted early, we pushed back our first wave. So our first wave should have occurred pretty much along the lines of what we saw in the UK and elsewhere. It should have occurred sometime in April or late April, early May. Instead, our first wave occurred in June and July. And you can see the way in which the cases rose. It started off in the Western Cape, spread to the Eastern Cape, and then to the rest of the country. And the admissions occurred in the gray bars, and you can see how it rose during our first wave. And when we ended our first wave, there was a, a bit of people trying to figure that it was a bit surreal because they somehow thought it was going to be worse. And many people commented on that to me. And I said, but it was pretty bad. They said, no, it wasn't that bad. I said, OK. But that was the perception that the epidemic wasn't. And in some ways, it's not an incorrect perception. For example, none of our field hospitals, if you take, for example, the Cape Town ICC, where 
800 beds were set up, all with oxygen, we never had more than 500 patients in there. So the Cape Town ICC was never full to capacity. So in some ways, yes, we didn't, we, we, we planned for more and we didn't have as bad an epidemic, but I think it was because we were preparing for the worst. And I think partly uh, behaviors had changed, partly government interventions had contributed, but whatever it was, our first wave, which in my view was severe, but many people didn't see it as severe, but we then went into low transmission. Initially, I had anticipated we would see our second wave at the end of December, early January, because of the movement we see in December. But I hadn't factored on two things that changed that. The first was that university students and high school students, particularly matriculants, they were going to party. And rules about not more than 100 people were not going to apply to them. And the rules of social distancing, masks, and so on, that was for other gatherings, didn't apply to their gatherings. And that was very unfortunate. But when we had a situation like that, where we had a super spreading event, it created the opportunity for the virus to seed more broadly in the community. And then before we know it, virus is spreading within the community. It wouldn't have been bad on its own, except that at the same time that we were grappling with the super spreading event, we had a new variant. And that new variant was more transmissible. And we now know that there are over a thousand infections that occurred, for example, in the Belito rage. And in the sequences we've done, several of them are the 501YV2 variant. So we created the opportunity, well not we, but this rage created the opportunity to, to s provide the seeds for our second wave. And our second wave grew. It grew rapidly. If you compare it to our first wave, which is more like a, I said, a Mount Kilimanjaro, the second wave is really a Mount Everest. The rapidity with which the cases grew was unanticipated. We could not have thought that we would have a virus that was that much more transmissible, estimated at about 50% more transmissible. And of course, if you look at the gray bars, the number of admissions grew rapidly in addition. And that put a huge amount of pressure on our healthcare system. And you felt that. Healthcare workers were falling ill because of exposure, putting pressure on those who were still at work, there was pressure on hospital beds and oxygen, on all the systems in place. We simply could not have anticipated that it would hit us this hard. And now we are in the throes of low transmission again. And how we deal with that low transmission will define what our trajectory will be. So let me reflect on the year. Now that I've told you about the epidemic trajectory, told you about the world situation on the pandemic. Let's look at the year. So how did it all begin? I was on vacation in uh, the Drakensberg with my family. And I, we were on a hike in the Berg and my iWatch gave me an alert. And it's a ProMed alert. I get the ProMed alerts and this alert said that there were cases of an undiagnosed pneumonia in a place called Wuhan in China. And as, it, as the alert came in, I looked at it and I said, oh, it's nothing. I said, it's, if it's anything, it's going to be SARS. The Chinese have dealt with it before. They know how to deal with it. I didn't give it a second thought. And I just carried on with my hike. I had no idea at that time what was to follow. So what happened thereafter? Well, on the 11th of January, I had been, I had come back to work. And my colleague, Professor Tulio de Oliveira, whose laboratory is below my laboratory, one floor down, uh, 
if you know him, you know he's a very effervescent sort of scientist. He's very excitable. So he comes up to me with his cell phone and he says, have you seen this? Have you seen this? I said, what are you talking about? He says, the sequence of the virus is on Twitter. I said, you've got to be crazy. Twitter is for teenagers to talk to each other. I didn't know you put <laughs> viral sequences. It must be in a journal. And he says, no, this is how science is now being shared. It's on Twitter. So he says, look at it. I'm going to show it to you. So he opens it up on his computer and shows me a sequence. And we both said, this is something different. We didn't know what, but it, it sent a little red flag. So back in the 11th of January, the red flags started. Because shortly thereafter, my colleagues from the CDC in China made the announcement that human-to-human -human transmission had now been shown. And once they had shown human-to-human -human transmission, we knew that the situation was going to escalate. And sure enough, by the end of January, the WHO declared a public health emergency of international concern. And that essentially told all of us we're now dealing with an imminent pandemic. I didn't really appreciate what it was going to be. I didn't really have an idea. But on the 30th of January, I'm now dealing with not just a red flag, but I'm dealing with a siren. I'm dealing with lots of flags telling me things are not going to be OK. And so. I called my team together. It was somewhere close to the middle of February. And we sat down and we said, what are we going to do? And we said, well, we've got to be prepared. The important thing is to be ahead of this situation. We've got to be prepared. So we discussed it. We said, we're going to separate the lab. We're going to put a soft partition through the lab. And we're going to use half the lab, or one section of the lab. And we're going to set up to do the COVID testing. In fact, it wasn't called COVID then yet. I think it, it was still being called novel coronavirus at that time when we had this meeting. And we said, we're going to do this. And they said, well, how are we going to do it? We don't have the reagents. We need the primers. I said, no, don't worry. We'll contact Beijing. We'll check with the Beijing Genome Institute whether they can help us. And true to form, Tulio and I worked with them. And before you know it, Beijing sends us the first kits. We are now set to do the testing. And we start the testing. We started somewhere around the third week or so of February. We're doing the testing and there's no cases. They're all just negative. They're all just negative. And we're wondering, you know, this is not going anywhere. We're doing a lot of testing here. It's costing a lot of money. But we're not finding any cases. Because what we were doing is we were testing patients who had a respiratory disease and fever. That's what we were doing, just looking in case they have the virus. And we weren't finding any. And of course, all that changed on the 5th of March. On the 5th of March, to me, and I'm not sure whether it was the same for all of you, but this epidemic became real. Until then, we were talking about it as something that happening elsewhere. It was happening in Italy. It was happening in New York. It was happening in China. It wasn't happening here. But for the first time on the 5th of March, that realization hit the epidemics here. Now, fortunately, we had already established a protocol for the testing. We already established a study to look at how the virus was being transmitted. So we were already set by the time the first case had occurred. And of course, then we had the state of disaster. I've already talked about that, the early actions that were taken. and then. Shortly thereafter, I, uh, my assistant got a call from the minister's office to say the minister's called a meeting that he'd like you to attend, and they were just getting all my contact details. And I said, sure, I'm happy to attend. So I attended this meeting. It was in the morning of the 23rd of March, if I remember correctly. And at this meeting, the minister, there were about 50, 60 scientists or so, several government, Department of Health officials, the minister was there, the DG was there. And in that meeting, we talked about the coronavirus and what, you know, what do we understand about it? What are, what are we going to do about it? 
And so the minister proposed that he'd like to have an advisory committee. And so that's how the advisory committee was established then and there. And it was about a two and a half hour meeting by Zoom. Towards the end of the meeting, the DG was just outlining that he'd like to have a team of clinicians, he'd like to have a team of laboratory people, and he'd like to have a team of public health people because they wanted advice on clinical management, on how to do the testing and so on, and then what to do about public health. So he wanted those three groups to be formed. And he, just out of the blue, I'm sitting, I mean, I'm in the meeting by Zoom, and he says, and Professor Abdul Karim will be the overarching chair. And of course, I, I, I sort of sat up in my <coughs> chair. Uh, it, I mean, it, it didn't really need to ask me because I was always going to say yes. I consider this my duty. I was going to do it. Uh, but I think for me, it brought home and, and the realization that we really need to know a lot more about this virus. And that it became clear to me that the minister was doing something that I hadn't really thought about in the same way. That if we are going into this kind of battle, he needed science. He needed to have the, the knowledge, the information, the evidence to help in that process. And he set this up to be able to get that. And I was honored to have been asked to play this role. And of course, shortly thereafter, comes the St. Augustine's uh, outbreak, which I've already touched on, that I got involved in. And so it wasn't just that I was trying to read, because very little in the literature, literally, uh, almost nothing. In fact, on the, uh, on the 24th of March, I asked my assistant to, uh, I'm not sure it was the 24th, but somewhere early in that time of the epidemic, I asked her to do a search for what do we know about lockdown? Look at the literature and tell me what's published on lockdowns, especially how you ease lockdowns and how do you impose lockdowns. And the answer is there were only three articles, well, three publications. One was a newspaper article about a lockdown in Mexico for swine flu. The second was a lockdown in Sierra Leone for Ebola. And the third was the Chinese put a manual on the lockdown from Wuhan. That was it. Nothing. So if you want to say, where's the evidence on how you impose lockdowns or ease lockdowns, didn't exist. No such thing. There are no. In fact, we don't even use the word lockdown in public health. It's, it's a military concept. And it, it got borrowed and got applied in this particular instance. So let's move on now that we've dealt with March. So I thought I would just mention Mr. Musa. I called him this morning and asked him if he'd like to join me here. So he said, no, he wasn't available today. But he says, you should feel free to discuss my case, at, you know, and you can use my picture. So that's why I was originally going to just keep him anonymous. But I can tell you that Mr. Musa, so while St. Augustine's taught me about how this virus was spreading, Mr. Musa taught me about the viral dynamics because I could not fathom out what was going on. He remained persistently PCR positive a, with no symptoms. And so Professor Dolivera at CRISP took on the challenge and said, OK, let's sequence his virus. So he was, was one of the very early viruses, one of the first that we sequenced. And when we sequence these virus, of course, now we do sequencing all the time for the variants. But I'm talking now, you're going back all that way. We sequence these virus, and that's when we showed that his virus originated from the original Wuhan strain. It went to Australia because it was linked to a virus described in Australia. From Australia, it went to Europe, and that's where he got it when he brought it back into South Africa. He picked it up there. So we began to understand his own, the, the, the dynamics of his own virus and how his virus was now teaching me a whole new world about how this virus remains with you for a long time. I contacted Penny Moore, 
And I said to Penny, can we look at his antibodies? And so we looked at his antibodies. We were trying to understand why was he not clearing the virus. And I'd never heard of this. It, it, it was unheard of at the time. I hadn't see, known about how this was occurring. And then when I look in the literature, I see there were 123 cases in South Korea in a little report about patients who were persistent and so began to understand. So I'm giving you an impression of how knowledge grew and how our understanding of this virus grew in this time. So let me try and speed up a bit. The 13th of April was a sea change for me because it, it started with the minister on Thursday saying to me, can you please address the parliamentary portfolio committee and tell them about the coronavirus? I said, okay, I'm happy to do that. I'll make some slides. So I made a slide set and he thought that the presentation was so good, he thought, well, you should really present this to NAP joints tomorrow. I said, okay, I'm happy to do that. And it evolved the next thing. And he says, okay, the next day, can you present it to the president? I said, okay, I did that. The president said, we need to share this with the public. And I said, okay, I'll prepare something for tomorrow. He said, no, no, you're going to do it today. The president wasn't happy enough. We're going to tell, tell everybody tomorrow. He heard it today. Everybody else should hear it today. And so at 7 o'clock that evening, I am sitting at the command center, and I'm doing this presentation. And the minister is sitting here with me, and... I've never done a presentation with slides on television. And clearly, the television people had never done a presentation with anybody who'd done slides. Because I'm now on slide 11, and the minister leans over and says, nobody can see your slides, because the cameramen are focusing on you. And I'm saying, no, don't they know they must focus on the slides? Well, they've never done this before. We were all learning. And if you remember, I had to start again. This time with the cameras now focused on the slides and I did my presentation. It has been documented as the, the point at which opinions in this country shifted. It shifted because until then, we didn't really understand what we were dealing with. We were just scared, anxious, and suddenly now we understand this vice. Because I, I started off with the Wuhan seafood market how the virus came about, how it spread in our country, how it's transmitted. I even explained we have no mojo that's going to protect us. I said, this epidemic is coming, and I, I didn't sugarcoat it in any way, and then I mapped out our eight-stage response. And in doing that, I basically told you about the past, I told you about the present, and I told you about what's likely in the future. And people were then able to better understand what we're dealing with. Well, in the gap that we had, because we didn't see our first wave so early, we were able to mobilize community health care workers for screening. We saw huge amounts of efforts in terms of preparing field hospitals. And of course, in the waves, I learned one thing. As the cases go up, people get anxious, people get worried, they get concerned, and they feel helpless. And so they want their miracle cure. They want a miracle cure. And they want to know why you're not letting them have their miracle cure. In the first wave, I dealt with two miracle cures. Both of them, drugs against parasites. The first was hydroxychloroquine, which is a drug used originally for malaria and is now used for lupus and used to treat scabies. And you, can, you can't imagine now what I had to deal with hydroxychloroquine. The first thing is, every pharmacy was sold out. People were now importing hydroxychloroquine from India. The US president was promoting this drug. All kinds of issues I was grappling with. But finally, we laid it to rest when the evidence came showing that it had no benefit. The second I had to deal with was another drug against malaria, artemisinin. Don't you know that the president of Madagascar is putting atomism in the bottles, is giving it to people in Madagascar. They don't have any COVID. Where's our, our atomism? Why aren't we getting it here? And we had to explain that, no, it doesn't work. Well, I learned that that's not restricted to the first wave. In the second wave, we had our new set of drugs, also drugs that work against parasites in ivermectin. I explained it to you. It kills roundworms. 
It's not, it doesn't work against viruses at the doses at which you use, but people want their medical drug. And it's particularly disturbing because medical people are aware of the rigorous way in which we decide on what treatments are effective. Well, you can't convince people when they want their medical cure. So let me go on to the scientific breakthroughs that we saw. On the 16th of June, the first major breakthrough in dexamethasone, reduced deaths by about a third. We then went in June, July in our first wave, and then we started seeing new test kits starting to arrive. The technology of PCR takes you three days to get a result. No, we can get results quickly. Move to rapid testing. And of course, in July, we reached a benchmark of half a million cases. In August the 26th came a really important study that we were all trying to understand. Can somebody get reinfected? And the answer was yes. In Hong Kong, they described the first case of reinfection. And as we moved on on the 1st of October, the challenge of vaccines was going to be just simply too large. We needed some highly skilled individuals who really know this area, and so the map for vaccines was created by the minister. Shortly thereafter, on the 9th of November, Pfizer announces the amazing results of their breakthrough vaccine. The initial results were more than 90%, and when we saw their preliminary first set of results, 95% effective. I had not even known that a, vi a vaccine was even possible. Humans had never made one before then against the coronavirus. And then on the 18th of December, we saw a huge change. So while the vaccine results in November gave us hope, all we need to do is just vaccinate everybody and we can see the end of this epidemic. When the variants became evident, when Professor Dolivera and I announced the 501YV2 variant, we knew we were not just announcing a variant. We were announcing that the simple approach of a vaccine ending the epidemic was not going to be enough. And so we have been dealing with this, including a severe second wave with the 501YV2 variant. In the midst of all of this, I've been really pleased and excited to see the amazing contributions by South African scientists. Now, I've just taken the four you know, highest impact journals, the New England Journal of Medicine, Nature, and Science. And the amount of new information on this pandemic that South African scientists were contributing, and not just to these three journals that I've listed here, but also to The Lancet. And you can see that The Lancet, because it has multiple journals, there were several articles published in The Lancet. So South Africans were making an important scientific contribution to the whole global community on the coronavirus and COVID-19. So let me go on to the lessons. I gotta wait for the, yeah, okay. So let me just briefly, before I go on to the lessons, deal with the challenges of providing scientific advice. I mean, I think the first issue I've already touched on is that we really grapple in the midst of uncertainty. There is so little information that is available. And in the midst of that level of uncertainty, it is very difficult for us to provide anything that can be, can be advice with, that says, you know, this is going to happen. It's all about this may happen or that may happen. And we, in that myriad of uncertainty, you'd be amazed at how many people have very strong views. Because there's no evidence, all views are legitimate. And they will have very strong views on the whole spectrum. And that's really important, because that's what helps us understand where we're going. But we have to be careful that personal opinion and speculation doesn't masquerade as science because it's just your views. It's just your opinion. It's not evidence-based. And we have to be careful with those that think that they know it all, especially in uncertainty, because they can mislead you. And the individuals who are the sort of focus on me individuals, and I've dealt with my fair share of all of these kinds. And there's also a big difference between advising and posturing. There are some people who are, who are posturing. They basically have a position they want to promote. 
as opposed to saying, what's the evidence, what's the advice, what's the uncertainty? And we can't let personal preferences dictate what we advise. We have to stay true to what the evidence is. It has to be congruent with what the evidence is. Even in the absence of evidence, we just got to say we don't know. And here's the options. And there's a very big difference, because I think part of the problem we had was that initially, on, in April when I did the presentation, people began to see the role of science. And so the distinction between the two, between scientific advice and political decision making, became complicated. I'm going to wrap up. <clears throat> I'm just going to touch on briefly here about how truthfulness became a casualty. For making claims that you know, 40 to 45 percent of the population you know, has now contrary, we've got herd immunity, we don't need to worry about a second wave, common cold viruses have protected us, we've got, I mean, all kinds of things people have said. And then we've got, of course, the band of individuals who say, ah, it's nothing, there's, there's denial, you know, it's just the flu, it's no worse than the flu. And then, of course, we've seen the conspiracy theories, and one of the biggest promoters of conspiracy theories, of course, was President Trump at the time. So I'll just draw on these five lessons that I take away. The first was that when you're dealing with a threat of this nature, you've got to take the disease seriously. It's not about a time of prevarication. You have to take it seriously. You have to act timelessly. You have to make difficult decisions bravely because you have to be willing to do what is needed, even if it's unpopular. You don't get elected because you make decisions that destroy people's lives or uh, put them in an uncomfortable position. But you control an epidemic. So difficult decisions have to be made. And the importance of proactive planning, early implementation, and being truthful and proactive in communicating with the public. I don't think I've seen many other countries that have all these briefings that we have in South Africa. I've now myself done a bunch don't know how many of them. So I think it's very important that, that that communication is part and parcel of this process. And we get a daily update about our statistics. No other disease does that. The COVID-19 response has had its errors. It had its problems. It had its abuses. From the abuse we saw in the military patrols, the Collins Causa case, some of the irrational regulations that undermined confidence in government, the PPE corruption that just makes your skin crawl. We've seen these challenges. But I've also seen how South Africans can move mountains when we act together. From, I don't know about you, but when I was little, DeFi made the stoves and the fridges. Well, DeFi was making ventilators. When you think about all those ventilators, the CPAPs that were being distributed to the various hospitals, those were all being made by companies like DeFi, about how people were helping other people in times of hardships, the Solidarity Fund, and that we draw upon this experience to prepare for the next epidemic, the need to create the capacity to do that. And I'm going to just quickly end off. I'm going to skip this here, and I'm just going to end off with where does our future lie? And I fundamentally believe that it's going to lie in our ability to work together, to understand that in solving this epidemic and solving this pandemic, we cannot do so if we work in isolation. We've got to work together. And I'd like to end off by quoting Pope Francis in this editorial he published in the New York Times. And I'll quote, the pandemic has exposed the paradox that while we are more connected, we are also more divided. To come out of this crisis better, we have to recover the knowledge that as a people, we have a shared destination. The pandemic has reminded us that no one is saved alone. What ties us to one another is what we commonly call solidarity. Solidarity is more than acts of generosity. As important as they are, it is the call to embrace the reality that we are bound by the bonds of reciprocity. And Mandela said it better than any one of us when he captured for us the spirit of Ubuntu. I am safe 
because you are safe. You are safe because I am safe. We are interdependent. And we cannot defeat this epidemic if we don't acknowledge our independence and acknowledge that we have to do so in solidarity. Thank you very much.